Hello, my fellow Alaskans. Thank you all for being here today. I'm sorry if I am muffled. I am on the backside of COVID, which I caught at the Anchorage Assembly meeting last Tuesday. I am here today with the Alaska School of Government, which is about ready to begin. Senator Mike Shower is the guest speaker, and uh, they are going to be here. He is going to be discussing about the Constitutional Convention here for the state of Alaska, which is coming up on this year's November ballot. And I'm hoping that every single one of you is going to vote yes for that. Today, where you should be also maybe hear a little bit about ranked choice voting and dark money. Woo! And any of you that have been paying attention, definitely pay attention to the PACs that are out there. That is P A C for political action committees who take on hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year and people like Walker who sold out or was trying to sell out 75% of Alaska's LNG to China who's now running for office has had over $200,000 given to his political packs to help him run in this up and coming next election. Lisa Murkowski on the other hand don't worry about her millions upon millions has been floating her direction and again for those that are just catching up and tuning in i'm wearing a mask because i'm on the back side of covid and i just don't want to take the chance of causing anybody else to catch this it really does suck but uh, as far as i've been able to tell i am no longer testing positive i still don't feel good though and i went back to add a full day of work today and i'm not about ready to miss what's going on today nor tomorrow night with the anchorage assembly who are going to override the veto for them wanting to have the impeachment powers to remove the mayor of anchorage will they override and will they veto his override his veto of the bill that they passed at the last assembly meeting only one way to find out and that will be to tune in tomorrow night if, God, if you're just getting on right now, please take a moment to like and share this video. That way, when it gets started, everybody will be able to watch and be able to participate with this. I will be monitoring this on Facebook so that uh, we can make sure that all of you get to hear and see and know what is going on. This right now is being streamed on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Politic Unfiltered on Facebook. So please tune in to all of your favorite places if you haven't already liked and shared or hit that notification bell at any of your favorite channels. Take a moment to do that right now. I wish I could do this on these channels tomorrow at the assembly, but they just don't have enough bandwidth to be able to run this type of a connection to be able to do that. So I will be on Facebook only tomorrow night. But if you're on Facebook, I do have the ability to share to about 18 different pages is the moment that I go live. So no matter what favorite page is, you'll be able to participate and tune in. Hello. What's up? <laughs> So again, if you're just tuning in right now, please don't hesitate. Like and share this video that was Senator Mike Shower standing there in front of me just a second ago. And uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversation. I just can't wait. It's about ready to begin. And uh, I will be quiet on my end here in just a second. I'm going to flip the screen. I, I am on the backside of COVID right now, and I'm still not quite feeling okay. I've tested clean, though. I have tested clean, though. But uh, I just want to, I'm, I'm being extra precautious. I've been around seniors all day. But you gotta love the color. I, I mean, uh, I, 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 you should have seen the one I was wearing earlier today, but I got it so dirty that I couldn't continue, but it's pink. That was the color I had all day long. <laughs> so again, if you just do oh, wow, that goes squeak. So if you're just tuning in, please like and share this video. We're about ready to go live. I was just talking there with uh, Senator Mike Shower. He was uh, poking a little fun at me. He's never seen me in a mask before. In fact, not a single person in this room has ever seen me in a mask before. 
so it's kind of a shocker for everybody to be seeing this on my face. But I am just doing my part how you say I don't want to take a chance of uh, any spray droplets or anything like that getting anybody else here at, at, at this darn disease after three years of avoiding it and then go to an Anchorage Assembly meeting of all places, that's where I catch it. That is the scary part. So I'm going to shut up here on my end. I'm going to flip the screen around. I'm going to raise the camera and uh, plug in the microphone and they should be starting here real soon. So again, please like and share. a couple of items that people suggested and um, I want to tell you why we can't do them to de in defense of myself I guess <laughs> but anyway somebody had asked why we couldn't do like a baseball schedule you know or a football or basketball schedule you know where you get you know when the game is at and the date and all of that kind of stuff um, in my defense, what I want to try to do is to have quite a bit of flexibility in uh, bringing up topics and people that are currently something or bringing forth something that is pertinent to you at this time. When we started it 18 months ago, I don't think I really realized at that time that the Constitutional Convention was going to be such a hard, hot topic. We hadn't really been able to even fully become identified or even start to be identified with ranked choice voting. So it's a little bit difficult. On We normally try to do the first and third Monday evenings and we always have it here. But uh, last month we deviated from that because there had been several requests to have Sarah Palin and I had pursued her uh, 
pretty hard, and so the only date she had available that she could come or would come uh, was the second Monday in July. And so I felt that that was important then to be able to do that. So that is, if so, if somebody can figure out a way for me to do a baseball <laughs> schedule and not have, and not be tied down, because I don't want to be discussing something that's old news to you, okay, we already made up our mind, or, you know, we've already heard from, you know, that subject two or three times. I want to keep it really relevant to what exactly is going on. So that's, that's my defense for answering that question, um, but I'm, op I'm still open to suggestions. Um, one of the other ones was uh, the last couple times we've asked people to line up over here for questions and somebody had suggested that that was keeping people from asking questions and um, we do not want that to happen so but we want to encourage you to be able to get out of your comfort box you know because when you go to assembly meeting or a school board meeting they're not going to pass the mic around to you you're going to have to stand up in front of people and come so we'll do a mixture but I would encourage you as much as possible to come out of your comfort zone and do that because we are a pretty safe place here, I believe, regarding, uh, you know, people loving you and if you stumble or fall or something, nobody's going to ridicule you or if you have to repeat the question or anything like that. So this is a place to be educated, get involved, and get motivated. So. That's Where what we line have. Up? Pardon? Where do you want us to line up? Line well, we're going to have over here, but we'll give you grace, you know, if you want to sit there. But I know there's no reason for you to sit there, Mr. Stoffel. I know you. <laughs> so I, you probably should go over there and sit on the front chair right now. So <laughs> uh, one of the other things we talked about was to have a pass out card because I know when people say something to me about the school of government and then I, of course I start rambling about it and I, in about two sentences I can just tell like they're, let's see, what am I having for dinner tonight? You know, they were, I've already lost them. So we did come up with a card and you're welcome to take as many. On the front it just talks a little bit about where we are and what we do. And on the back, there is a line there for if you know who the next speaker is or and you know what the next meeting is or they can text that uh, phone number on the bottom and uh, and then they will get a text regarding it so uh, those I think are about the oh one person and I, I don't want and I don't even know if they're here tonight uh, because I didn't ask anybody to sign their name. So one I, person I would like to have, uh, if you'll talk to me afterwards, if you're here, is uh, said they wanted um, somebody to speak on the uh, Alaska Native experience slash situation. And I'm not sure exactly if they were talking about uh, Native land claims or uh, you know, suicide in the in the in the bush area, or you know, whatever. So, um, and like I said, I'm not going to ask you to stand up now and explain it. But if you would reach out to me, or one of the ladies that is at the table, to take and uh, and do that, uh, because we would, I would like to address it, and it very easily could be something. Um, the other thing that if you did see the post. I have extended, I wrestled with this for a long time, in fact, I think even a number of times I asked the majority of, yeah, the majority of the times to ask people just to be prayed about it, is how we were going to handle the gubernatorial candidates, because no matter who I am favoring or whatever, we're trying to keep a pretty level uh, field regarding giving everybody the same opportunity. So this last Monday, uh, for, to all of the Republican gubernatorial candidates, I sent an email 
and I gave them a choice of meeting and coming to our school either August 1st or August 15th. And then um, tonight I was talking to somebody and uh, the candidate that they are supporting had not reached out to me and I said, you know, if, if they, again, like what we did with Sarah, if they could only maybe come on the 8th, I would have to check to be sure the church was available and then we could adjust it. Um, again, being a little bit selfish, Monday night is about the only night in the month that, or in the week that I have available. Tuesday nights are always assembly meetings, Wednesday is church, Thursday is generally some kind of political meeting, or we could do Friday or Saturday or something like that. But So that's, uh, I think, all of the housekeeping things that I had to say, and we will have a time at the end for people to ask questions as well as so it's 717 so if we give you what do you want to do about half hour 40 minutes and then have a half hour questions that okay all right so uh, i think that's all the housekeeping items i have again thank you yes d mm -hmm. um on uh, tomorrow i'm actually going to be with uh, the borough clerk, and we're going to be discussing voting by machines. And if the no tomorrow, tomorrow's is only for the certification, yeah. certification, certification of like the election. 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 That's all that's on the agenda for the assembly. That is true. I'm right. just meeting with her at about I think at about two early in the afternoon. I just wanted all, all I'm really saying here is if people don't want us to vote by machines, they need to be really, really loud. We need to be heard. So if I'm, I'm, I'm I don't, I'm happy to do the point on this. But I sure need to hear when I say people are roaring for that change. We need to hear the roar. So I just thought I'd sense there was going to be a lot of people here tonight. Just that uh, we had the. Oh yeah, you got that, okay. John. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we'll do announcements at the end, so everybody that has an announcement will get a chance to say. But yeah, tomorrow night's assembly meeting is at six. The only item, two items that are on the agenda. One is audience participation. Of course, who's open to anybody, any subject. They want to come and address to the assembly. And the other item is the certification of the election that was held on July 12th. So that's the only two items that uh, there will be any action at all. Alrighty, I will give them to you, sir. Oh, one more thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's what happens when you get to be the boss, see? Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, I, I know some people here in the audience are already thinking about they want to be delegates or would like to be delegates uh, if we do have a constitutional convention. And if you are thinking about that, I would encourage you to get this book. This is, and you will need to memorize this book if you are going to be asking people to take and vote for you as well as so you won't be plowed over if you are selected as a delegate, you will need to know that it's an excellent um, resource. So, oh, sure. Thank you. And this one is the January 2021, I think that's the latest edition of the book. Probably Amazon. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> you can download it. You can download it from the legislative website. It's right on the front page. Okay, the great. Constitutional resources. You can get that whole thing as a download PDF. Great. Thanks, Pat. Yep. Good. All righty. Maybe. Huh? <laughs> oh, you got one. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Senator Shower, I don't think needs any introduction. I just thank him. He has been somebody that we can call up on time after time when we've been doing, since we've been doing the School of Government. And so uh, I, and sir, we will all enjoy this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Edna. Uh-oh. Are we on? We are. No? Yes?
How about Let now? Let me give him this one. All right, we'll switch. They weren't able, yeah, they weren't able to get that one. I don't one. have the Energizer Bunny batteries. How about now? Better. Yeah. I can hear it. Okay. Uh, that is, by the way, that book that Edna has is probably, unless you want to read the minutes and get into the deep background and, you know, from the Constitutional Convention, the first one in 1955, which I've done, and it will also put you asleep if you have a hard time sleeping at night. Um, that's the best primer I've read yet. It's condensed. It's all there. It's a really good book. So, and it's not a hard read. So, um, she's right. If you have any interest at all, just in the convention in general, our Constitution or how it works, it's a great place to start. So, for what it's worth. So, Eddie and I talked about this tonight. We talked a few months ago that I would come in and discuss the Constitutional Convention in general tonight. That's what we're going to discuss because of time being the kind of the limiting factor. We're going to focus on the Constitutional Convention, and I know some people had questions, maybe a few, about ranked choice voting. That's it. I'm not going to talk about anything else tonight at all just because that's the closest alligator to the vote. That's what's in front of us. We're a couple weeks away from the primary, and then, of course, we'll go into the general. So, just... just Okay, and Binding Caucus, because she's the boss and said I have to talk about it, so that's fine. Um, I'll do that, but I'm going to avoid everything else for now, just for time, and I, if it's other things about legislative actions, whatever, I'll come back again at, at any time, and we'll discuss those, but I want to make sure we get to this, because this is, this is the thing in front of us. So, um, I have written a paper that I'm going to hopefully have published shortly, maybe in MRAC and Watchmen and some others, that's going to discuss this in some detail. Uh, I've been on the radio about it for some time, social media, so I'm just going to start this, with the, you know, if you were to go back in time a year ago and ask me about a constitutional convention, I would say, nah, they ain't not sure, I'm not really a supporter of it, and I would have kind of been on the fence, and I would have been a no. And now this year, I'm a solid yes. I've changed. And so that's one of the things people ask, Mike, why did you change from a no to a yes? We've always voted no. I can tell you there's a legislator up in Fairbanks, not a Republican, who ran a poll last summer, and when he asked the question, they were about 50-50. We've actually been having more no votes in time about the Constitution Convention every time it comes up every decade than in the past. And this year it's starting to change in the last year because people are starting to get frustrated. They're like, uh-oh, you know, we kind of lost control of our government um, to special interests, you know, whether it's a big union boss. It's not unions per se, I'm in one. It's not the average people, it's the people at the top. It's the union bosses, it's the big business uh, folks, leaders, and others, you know, special interest from the, uh, the nonprofits, et cetera, across the board. And I'll talk about that in detail. But what happened is I realized, as I've been down there with my nose under the tent for five years, and there's another legislator, maybe some other folks in here too, um, that have been in elected office before, is that we're not going to solve the problem. We can't. I think we're incapable of solving the problem. The closest we ever got was a few months ago towards the end of the session. You're going to laugh about this. I'm sitting there with three Democrats and me as the little Republican, right? Uh, actually, the biggest guy in the room, that's just size-wise. Right? So, uh, you know, they're experienced. They're all old. They've all been there a long time. And in the last day, um, the election integrity bill that I had, that I had to work with the Democrat because they weren't going to hear my bill and we weren't going to hear their bill. So we, we did the things in the middle, right? Because some people say, oh, Mike, you didn't get all the stuff there. I'm like, well, that's great. I could have my bill, but it's not going to move because the Democrats already said they're not going to hear it. But we did things like ballot carrying, ballot tracking, open source, which is going to be an issue about the ballots talking here in a minute, um, software and hardware, um, the voting roll cleanup, getting rid of the automatic voter registration, which is a massive problem because it's given us all those people. Those things were in the bill. We almost got it through because we combined it with those three Democrats helping because they wanted campaign limits. That tends to hurt conservatives more than liberals. I got it. Democrats versus Republican, fine. But even the governor talking to him and others, we could have passed that. That was combined with an APOC bill. That's the Christmas tree at the end. They put all this together and like, I'll do that. We get something rather than nothing. But as we got to the end, and then some of you may remember, um, David Wilson put in an amendment for that energy rebate thing. Well, I put in the amendment for the statutory PFT. And I could count, and I looked at it, I go, oh, Natasha von Emhoff's not here. I think we can win this one. And I put the amendment on the floor and it passed. And I was like, whoa, that's the first time since I've been there for five years, we got a statutory PFD. And it actually left the Senate at 5,500, not 42, because 42 was the, was the amount. There's a reason I'm telling you guys this, because this is what led me to finally, you know, earlier this year, I crossed that Rubicon and said, that's it, I'm done. We were this close to even that part of passing that, right? It was combined, it wasn't done correctly. The Senate finance coach, the, the Senate finance coaches and the House, they don't like the PFD, most of them are anti-PFD, so they, they, you know, if they got their hands on it, they're going to chop it down, and they did. But they combined the budget, so we couldn't have a separate PFD vote, we couldn't have a separate capital budget, a separate operating budget, blah, blah, blah. That's inside politics, baseball, right, in the legislature. But when that passed, and there was a full PFD plus some that went out of the Senate, 
and they saw what was happening, they panicked. And they're like, oh my God, we're, we're losing the battle here. And all of a sudden, those Democrats and some others came to me and they go, Mike, you're the guy leading the charge, you know, in the Senate side at least, right? On the PFD and those other things. Like, we're kind of interested in that 50 50 plan again. And I'm like, oh, isn't that something? No, you kind of missed your chance when you could have done that last year when we had the working group and those other things. And even with that, even with being able for the first time since I've been there to have a full statutory PFD, a potential at least, right, some movement on it, and looking at, you know, campaign finance reform, APOC filings, uh, some kind of plan of putting the PFD in the Constitution so we're done with it. I mean, we were close, but we still weren't going to make it. We still weren't going to get the votes in the House or the Senate to pass it. And so what I looked at as we went through that is, you know, that's it, I'm done. I said, there's no way we're ever going to solve this. This may be the closest we ever got, and it probably isn't going to get any closer. So that, my fellow Alaskans, if I was to use the political speak, is what pushed me over the edge to say that's what I'm, I, I can't trust and I don't believe that the legislature is ever going to solve the problem. In fact, I would argue, I don't think the legislature, some people, not all, there's some of us that want to solve it, right? But I don't think many legislators are interested in solving it because if we solve the problem, what happens? Two things. One, many of them will lose the power to be able to manipulate the budget and everything else to however they want to do it. And the second thing is they will lose the ability to use that leverage with the groups that give them that power, right? Votes and other things, because all of a sudden that's gone. If we solve the PFD and it's off the table and they can't manipulate that anymore, if we have a constitutional, a change to our current constitutional spending cap so they can only spend so much and we lock a few other things away, how much power do they have, right? How much power? They have almost none anymore to manipulate things to their advantage. So they, I think many, not all, but many actually don't want to solve the problem. They want to keep this perpetuated year after year after year. So I got backwards and I said, well, how are we going to fix this? And I thought to myself, and I've heard people say, even on the radio today, because I was on the Picaro show earlier, he asked me about a few things. I was like, well, okay, um, yeah. Some lady called on that was, or, you know, that after I spoke and she was a public employee union. I have to make that clear. I'm not anti-union. I'm in a union. I said it a few minutes ago. I mean, the average union person is just a normal person trying to do their, you know, live their life, whatever. The higher up you get, it becomes political. And I've seen how those people play, and it's not good, right? They're just as interested. They're more political than some of your politicians. It's all about power and what they get, right? And so I looked at it and said, it's not, that's not what it's about. And they say, well, there's fear, right? Because that's the biggest thing. What have you heard? I and mean, I'm going to ask for hands here. I know every, it's, it, most of the time we don't like people ask for audience participation. Um, but how many people here have heard in some form or fashion that the Constitutional Convention is dangerous, it's going to open everything up, it's going to turn the state upside down? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, that's just about everybody, because that's about all you hear, right? Yeah. How many people have heard either through the Anchorage Democratic, I'm sorry, the Anchorage Daily News, or the Juno uh, Empire, or anybody else, that somehow the Constitutional Commission is a good thing and it's going to return to power people. Show of hands. Not for me. For me, haven't you heard it? You haven't. Almost nobody. Why is that? That's the narrative, right? They want you to be afraid Fear. of it. So I ask the question. Sorry, I, I know the camera guys are always. I, I drive them nuts because <laughs> I'm moving and they're trying to follow me. I ask the question. What are you afraid of? Well, the people, we're going to get this, and they're going to do all kinds of wacky stuff. I'm like, so the first thing I think, hmm, the people. Who, if they actually read the Constitution, where's the power come from? Where's it derived? People. Oh, wait a minute, that's you. So they're actually afraid of people. not the big money coming from out of Alaska, not that they're going to lose control of things, you know, for that kind of stuff. What they're afraid of is that you are going to take the power back and then you're going to take the two things out of this that are the foundation of why so many people that we are discussing in groups are fighting this. It's two things. It is throughout the history of mankind. Power, that's number one, and money. That's what it's about. All of the groups, when you start thinking about who it is, big union bosses, big business leaders, nonprofits, other groups, where do they get their money from? many of them or a lot of it it comes from the government coffers they're feeding at the trough if we were to dry up some of that supply say lock the pfd away so it goes to you instead of through their hands what does that do to some of their power base what does that do to their ability to funnel money in ways that advantage them or their groups or who they work for it has a big impact 
what happens when the money dries up as well as to their power base, right? If you don't have the money to, to dole out, do people come to your office as much? Or are they going to be looking at you and go, hey, Mike, what do you got for me? Let's talk about that. Let's go out to dinner. But if I've got nothing to offer them, they're like, yeah, thanks, see ya. And I can tell you, folks, I've seen it and talked to people. That's how, that's how it plays out. Now, let me give you an example of how the special interests are so powerful in this state. Because I hear people say, oh, you know, you have people still have the power. You guys have all the power out there, right? I mean, sure, you do, right? You feel like you're in control of your government, don't you? You feel like your legislators are all, all have your best interests at heart, don't you? Hmm, interesting response. I would think people would think, oh, the Constitution says all power is derived from the people. Huh. Well, if that's the case, then could somebody explain to me when we passed out of the Senate that budget, right? And everybody has their opinion on the budget. That's fine. That's nice. I'm not going to get on that tonight. But it was fully funded and then some. I got an operating budget too big. But that was the choice they gave us. It had a lot of capital in it, which we're way behind on. We need anybody driven on the roads lately? <laughs> How good shape are they in? Potholes everywhere, et cetera, right? And the PFD went out at that amount, 5,500. Fine. What happened for those that paid attention, and maybe some of you didn't, over the next about four, four and a half days? Juno, that legislative building, was flooded with lobbyists and special interest folks, probably hundreds, I don't know, but it, the halls were full. And they were all coming down, and you know what their job was? You know what they did? They came down for days, and they threatened, they cajoled, they promised, as I heard, Story after story, talking to legislators who were getting them because they came. They didn't bother too much with the Senate. They were there, but they wanted to stop the House. And Louise Stutz, who was the House Speaker, held that vote. Should have taken that over and voted concurrence that day. Should have gone over and voted on it. We'd have been done out over. Held that vote for about four, four and a half days, something like that. David would know. He was, he was there. <coughs> and during that time, they exercised massive power to flip people's votes from a yes to a no. How many of you, did any, and you may have, did any of you call, say anything to your house members or anybody else about how to vote or whatever? Yes, no, anybody? Very few, I mean, some did, I know. There's very, a lot of you, by the virtue here, you're active, right? And, and what happens? My point is, I'm not so concerned about whether somebody voted yes or no. What concerned me and what I'm discussing here is watching the raw power that was exercised by the special interest in this state to control what happened? What they did was, as they said, I want another billion plus dollars in the pocket of special interest into the money hands of the finance co-chairs and those that are going to dole that money out because that's what they did. That's about what it ended up being. I think it's about $660 million for every thousand dollars of the PFD, 680 million, something like that. So when you consider we went from 5,500 to 3,200, math in public, that's about $1.4 billion that was taken out of the hands of Alaskans directly was kept into the government coffers because it's gonna go through the government coffers into the hands of those entities that exercised that raw power. That power was not with you folks, that power was exercised with the people that have it. This is my point. When I go back to what has changed my mind and I hope will change your mind and what you need to do and why you would vote yes for a constitutional convention is because the power doesn't reside with you and it hasn't resided with you for who knows how long not here in this state not in dc right you think any of us have any power what goes on in dc that's all that's just a lot more power a lot more zeros behind the number much bigger right so when you think about how this would play out and the why behind it it has everything to do with you usurping power back to the people right? This Constitutional Convention. Now, that's the reason why I want to give you the why and the context. We're going to talk a little bit more now about how this would work, okay? So, and I've got notes for myself, and I'll have to go back and look at them, because this is, this, you guys know this is how I talk better when I'm off the cuff, right? So, I'm not a good canned speaker. So, you have three votes in this process. Like the lady that was on the radio today after I spoke, she's like, well, the unions, I'm, a, I'm in the union and I work for the government and, and I'm afraid that the Constitutional Convention is going to open up, you know, they're going to take away our money and they're going to take away our retirement benefits. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not. None of that's in the Constitution anywhere. But do you see what I go back to? What are they selling? What did I ask you? Have you heard what's so bad about it? Fear, fear, and fear. 
scared. Be scared of it, folks. It's a scary thing. Remember those commercials back in the day, Fandango? That guy went up and tried to get his tickets because he didn't know what a Fandango was. like, Fandango, it's very scary. And the lady's like, what? What are you talking about? It's very scary. So dark money, you know, you get background noise coming in. That's how they, that's how they sold people to, to vote for ballot measure two with the ranked choice voting. It was scary dark money. So they're trying to sell you fear that if you vote for a constitutional convention, if you're a union member, you're going to lose your job. Your benefits are going to go away. No, they're not. First of all, that's not in the Constitution. That's a negotiating thing between the Department of Administration and a union. It has nothing to do with the Constitution. Not even close, right? They're going to tell you the dark money is going to flow in here. And I'm going to counter all this stuff in a minute. It's going to flow in from outside. You're going to lose control. No, they're not. They're selling you a structure that is flawed. They're going to tell you that, oh my gosh, we're going to open up and we're going to have a... Uh, uh, they're going to take the guns. Really? You guys are going to vote for that when it comes out? I don't think so. That ain't happening. Um, you're going to have to go on the other side of the aisle, right? Because we've got to cover all the different things. Oh, we're going to, they're going to take away abortion. Maybe they will. I'll tell you why I think that this is a more balanced thing here in a minute. I'm going to discuss it. Because everybody has their hot button issues. What I believe, when I look at the numbers, and I'm going to explain the structure now, is that you're not going to see those issues that are more what I would call niche as opposed to the big ones. Of all the things that matter, and I want you to think outside the box of this church and the things that matter to you for a moment, if it affects your wallet, that matters to almost everybody. Of the things we've discussed tonight, what are the things that directly affect all of you compared to some of these other issues? Direct money into your wallet, every last one. What is it? PFD, right? That's the issue. I'm telling you right now that if there's going to be a vote for the Constitutional Convention, it's going to be because... People want to do something to protect the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend for Alaskans who are supposed to have it, not in the hands of politicians who arbitrarily set it after they paid for everything. I've heard somebody, I've got a challenger, it's like, oh, I believe in a statutory PFD as long as the you know, government's paid first. I'm like, well, I don't think that's what it was supposed to be, nor do I think that's what the people want. It also acts like a cap, but that's a whole different discussion. So. There's another thing that many people are interested in. You, all of you, you have a budget, you have got a job, and so in effect you have a spending gap, right? I mean, you can go out and you can get a loan, you can use your credit card, but eventually those, do, those bills come due, right? So you have a spending gap. Can any of you go out and just spend as much as you want and then go take it from your neighbor and say, well, I spent a little bit more than I'm supposed to. I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna, I need the money. You're gonna be like, yeah, right, get off my property, okay? Unfortunately, the government can do that. We spend more. So that constitutional spending cap we have, which isn't effective, I've talked about it before, I believe also will get traction because the citizens understand we've got to cap government spending to get, quit spending like this. We've got to put that in check. We have statutory ones. Now, I know you're all going to laugh, but I've asked the question, how good is your legislative body, the state, in following this, the law? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, I know. Where's the car, John? Come on. So... I believe those two things affect everybody so much and they see that that they would, for example, get traction. I believe there would be a chance of something like that to pass. So before I get into the other, what I would call the, the more niche issues for people that are individuals, let me check my notes and make sure I'm not too far off here. First question. Yeah, I knew there'd be a couple I forgot. So um, we talk about the brilliant writers of the Constitution. They were wise, they were, they were brilliant, they, they were basically FDR Democrats, they were, right? So it is a left of center document. There aren't there are many people that will argue this. I've had stuff with a, uh, a political science professor, neighbors, Professor Neighbors in UAA, and he's, a, he's an actually conservative in the uni, you know, university. You know, it's like a rare sighting in the unicorn. Oh, there's one, catch him. Um, so, and, and he talks about it. It's a left of center document. That's acknowledged. I'm not saying it's a terrible constitution or bad, but it's certainly something that a lot of us, I think, today might want to see some changes, something different. But the first question is, I hear from people all the time, it's a perfect constitution, don't touch it. Why would we ever do that? Don't do that at all. And I'm like, huh, well, okay. So it was, it was written, well, nearly perfect after all the other states. So we had all the examples. Yes. And the people that wrote it were brilliant. Yes. Okay. Then explain to me if that's the case. Why did they also put in there every 10 years, there shall be the question asked of a constitutional convention. Were they wrong? Well, I, I don't think so, but that was perfect. They wrote it. Why did they put that in there? It's a, it's a loop. See, they can't answer the question. They love the Constitution until it gives them something they don't like. Then it's a problem. See what I'm saying? They put it in there for a reason, folks. And the reason they put it in is they knew. They were wise enough to know that someday in the future, 
There may come a time when the citizens needed to take some of that power back from the government. Changes might need to be made based on who was doing what. That's why it's in there. They can't tell me that the Constitution is good in this sense, but bad on that. They wrote it wisely, but they didn't know what the heck they were doing over here. Baloney. You don't buy it, neither do I. It was put that way for a reason. Because for times such as this, where the government stops listening to the people, where the government doesn't do what the people demand. In 1999, they asked the question, do you want us to change the PFD and how we distribute it? You know what your answer was? A resounding no for those that were here. It was 81%, I think, was the number that said, don't touch it. So we did. Do you, would you like to know when <laughs> I got elected and I was state affairs chair and we were hearing thousands of people, both written testimony, and I think I went through like 11 or 1,200 people. It was a record, you know, verbal testimony on the phone. I was limiting people to one minute. I did hours and hours and hours of it. I'm like, one minute cuts you off. One minute cuts you off because I had too many people. Would you like to know what that number was 20 years later in 2019 from 1999? About 80%. You really move the needle on what you think 1% in two years. Wow, okay, that's impressive. Point is, folks, the framers were wise enough to put that in there. And they put it in there because they knew that the time might come when we stop listening to you. And we need to respond. So it's time for you to take that power back. Has the Constitution been amended? Anyone? Yes, it has. That's another argument where we don't touch that thing. Oh, don't crack up the Constitution. Dangerous. Then can you explain to me why we've amended it like 28 times or whatever the number? It's a big number. Did you know that? Most people don't know it. We've amended it many times. There's nothing wrong with that. There's a process for it, folks, for a reason. Because things might change. Circumstances might change. I'm not a fan of doing it willy-nilly. I told you starting off, I was like, mm, no, not really, but I've changed my mind. Because I realized that we're going to have to have you take the power back and do the job you elected us to do that we can't seem to do. Right? That's what's happening. Okay? So we have amended it. And there's a process for it. And it's there for a reason. Okay. So, I talked about money and power because I skipped ahead like I do in my brain. As opposed to going backwards. And a discerning citizen might look at the list of who opposes the Constitutional Convention telling you exactly why you want to vote for the Constitutional Convention. I'm asking you folks, just look at the list. Look at it. Look at who opposes it. I'll give you some names. John Coghill, Kathy Giesel. Uh, they're against the PFD. Look at the battle they fought. I mean, they, 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 they slaughtered a lot of their Republican colleagues like myself and Shelley Hughes and others lost our stuff, right? Because we voted against the budget in favor of the PFD. They took all of our stuff. You look at like uh, Joelle Hall, big union leader, right? She's anti-PFD. You look at, uh, you know, Mark Stedman, uh, Click Bishop, uh, Gary Stevens. I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying I'm looking at their votes. They're, they voted against the PFD, and they voted to continue to take it and not follow the statute. And they'll say, like, well, the statute says, you know, uh, or I should say, sorry, the, the courts have said we can do what we want. Yeah, but that's not right, right? And they're not in conflict, because they may know SB 26. We passed that bill. I actually voted against it. I was, that was when I first got there. And that was the percent of market value, this POMV thing, where you do this draw on your endowment, which they're calling the fund now. Well, they say that's the, the overriding law, so we should follow that one. I'm like, hmm, so you want to follow that law now, but you don't want to follow that one because you don't like, see how it works? It's just like the Constitution. Well, it's a great document, except for that part. I don't like it. That didn't go. Oh, we're going to follow this law, but yeah, not that one. I don't like that part of the law. It doesn't work for me. Okay? So what would happen, I asked this question um, not literally, if we enshrine the PFT in the Constitution, even if it's a 50-50 statutory or whatever it is, what would happen? Ooh, boy, all of a sudden we wouldn't even fight about that anymore. It's done. Can't touch it. What would happen if we changed the constitutional spending cap? Ooh, could you imagine what the legislative sessions might look like now? No more fighting over the PFT. No more, we only have this much to spend and that's it. There's nothing else unless, ooh, this could be interesting. If now we've limited the money supply to government, what do I have to do and other legislators if we want to spend more? What do we have to do? <laughs> for what? To ask, us for money. ask you for money. You think they want to come to you and say, I, I, I got to spend some more money and um, I'm going to have to raise your taxes and institute an income tax or whatever. And by the way, vote for me. <laughs> How's that going to work out, right? Not too happy, folks. They don't want to do that. Right? But can they take the PFD from you? And, and who really 
comes after them, right? I mean, it's a different thing. They don't have to ask. They just do it. Oh, well, I had to vote. Buy the caucus. Woo, there's that one, right? That's been an excuse for legislators for years in Alaska. Well, I had to vote for it because if not, they're going to take everything from me. Then I can't represent you. It's not my fault, right? See that one all the time, even from a few people up here over the years. Okay. So let's get to the actual concept. I apologize. It's just, I, it's, there's so much to talk about as usual. Edna knows that. So let's get to what would actually happen. So on the, the question shall be asked. So you're going to be asked in November on the general ballot. Will you vote for a constitutional convention? Yes or no? Let's say you vote yes. We get 50% plus one person says yes. We're going to have a convention. Okay, fight's on. It's going to happen. Lieutenant Governor, if you look at how it's written, we'll have set up the call, those kinds of things, date plays, that kind of stuff will happen. There's some things he does. And I want to be crystal clear, by the way, that none of this is necessarily written in stone. So if I say something, you go, well, I don't think that's true. It might be, it might not. This can change a little bit. So again, we haven't done it before, ex from, except the first one, right? So a lot of this, and, I, and I'll tell you why, I've asked Department of Law, I've asked the alleged legal, I've gotten opinions, I've done the alleged research, and I'll tell you, I get a conflicting opinion on all kinds of stuff. Yeah, this is how it's going to go down. Oh, it's going to be an up or down vote on anything that comes out. One, you know, you get one vote uh, on the, if we were to have a convention, they give you amendments. I've had other people say, no, 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 you get to vote up and down on each one, which is how I prefer it. Right? I don't always be stuck with it, I like to vote individually. So just understand that what I tell you is my best guess at what would happen. Some of it may change, and it will also depend on who's the lieutenant governor. How do they set some things up? But you get that first vote. We're going to set some things up. The legislature has some impact on this, right? The legislators, so we're clear, are not the ones that are going to the Constitutional Convention. A lot of people believe that. Some people are still spreading that rumor. Not true, okay? Because we're going to go on to step number two. The legislature will have that chance to do some work on the Constitutional Convention, how it's going to set up whatever. They can't defund it. How many of you guys have been around when they tried to move the capital of the legislature when you guys voted for it, right? How did they stop it? They didn't fund it. Right? They can't do that. It says right in the Constitution, it will have first call in the Treasury. If you vote for it, it's going to happen. They cannot stop it. They cannot defund it. So the second thing that happens, we're going to have an election. That election will be for delegates. Guess where the delegates come from? It's not your current politicians. It's going to be from you. Okay? Citizens can run and get elected as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. I can resign, and I can run to be a delegate. But I can't do both, right? I mean, if I was a really smart lieutenant governor, I'd be like, I think the convention's going to start about January 16th. Right about the time the legislative session starts. Guess what? Your legislators, oh, they can run for it, but they're going to have to give up that job they covet so much. Okay? Anyways, that's just another thing for whoever's listening out there that might want to do that. So you're going to vote for those delegates. You can run. You can put your name in the hat. Here's the other thing that's spread as one of those fear-mongering rumors. Oh, the legislators can... No, they're not. That's number one. Number two, you're going to have all this dark money, and we're going to have all these left-wing people, because in here we're pretty right, right? All these left-wingers are going to come in. How? Do you think the Matsu... Look at who you elect, right? Conservative people said, so, right? You think you're going to elect somebody that looks like they're the, you know, from the uh, city of Berkeley, California? You're not going to do it, folks. My point is is that we're going to be electing people across the state by district and region. So when you think people go, oh, it's going to be all these left wing or all these right wing. No, it's not. Your, your delegate body is going to look something like what the legislature does today. You're going to have some liberals. You're going to have some conservatives. You're going to have some people in the middle. So understand that. It's going to be a relative balance when they show up. You're not going to get this all left or all right. Okay? Another thing they talk about, that's a rumor, as we set up the structure, and then you elect those delegates and send them is the dark money, okay? Oh, how's that going to work? Oh, the dark money's going to come. And do what? They're going to bribe the delegates? What? I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I guess they could, but then hopefully they're going to jail. So no, that's not going to affect it. Oh, they're going to have these big campaigns. What? Are they going to give money to more conservatives from the MAPSU to get elected as a delegate? Where those districts are, folks, that's who you're going to get. So you're not going to get 90, you know, 54 liberals and one conservative. It's not how the state is set up. It's a lie. It's not going to work that way. Now, I know I see Bernard shaking his head. I get it. You can have people that can run and, and sell the story, right? Because sometimes maybe your politicians say something in a campaign they don't follow. I get that. My point to you is that what they're selling you right now is that it's going to be all this sweep of dark money coming in. You're going to have all these left-wing people and all this stuff, and it's going to be completely lopsided. I'm telling you, the structure is not set up that way. It's, because it's going to look something like your legislature today. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. You guys go, oh my gosh, your legislature is dysfunctional. You can't do anything. Right. Yeah, noted. 
but wait a minute, you just told me that we're going to have this sweep of dark money and it's going to do all this stuff. No, it's not. It's going to have the same problem of people on both sides arguing and having a hard time getting anything done. Here's the difference. How many people does it take to pass a constitutional amendment in the legislature? It's a two-thirds vote. That's a lot of people, especially when we're so split down the middle, kind of Republican, Democrat, et cetera, et cetera. Hard to get that number, which is one of the reasons why the legislature, I believe, will never get it done. Can't do it. But your convention delegates only need 50% plus one. All right, that's different. That's a much lower bar. So if they get something up there, I see that as a strength because it means they might actually get something like protecting the PFD and enshrining the Constitution and making it pass. They don't have such a high bar to jump over. So that matters, okay? Now, some people call it a strength, some people call it a weakness, right? So I would generally argue the legislature, you want a high bar because you don't want us just doing a bunch of weird stuff. You never know what you're going to get. But for the Constitutional Convention, because it's different, here's an interesting point somebody brought up to me a few months ago I hadn't thought about. Your delegates... When they go, it's a legacy. They're going to go. It's a one-time thing, probably a couple months. The first one was like 75 days, I think, whatever, and it's over. They're not going to go be a legislator year after year and politicians, all that kind of stuff. What they do, they're going to want to get it right. And yes, there may be some ideologues. They may throw the spear and be done, but it's going to be their name on that document signed. I'm here to argue that your average citizen is probably going to do a better job than your average politician because they're going to want to get it right, fix it, and go away. Your politician wants to go back year after year after year and is going to tell you whatever they need to tell you to get elected and continue in that seat because that's where they covet. I trust you. That's the difference, folks. I'm telling you, the people that are against the Constitutional Convention, they don't trust you. They don't. They think you're going to go screw it up. They think you're going to go take the power away from them. That's the difference. It's part of what pushed me over the line to it. I don't trust us anymore down there, but I trust you. That's the structure. That's your second vote, part of, the, part of the structure, okay? So you pick the delegates. Now, we're going to have a convention. It's going to be somewhere. I don't know where. First was in Fairbanks, and they wanted to get it away from the Capitol. Probably a wise move. You know, some of that stuff. And who the heck wants to go to Fairbanks? So I said, do it in Fairbanks in the middle of January. You're not going to the lobbyists want to go up there from you know, down south. Make sure it's minus 40 for a couple of weeks. I think we'll do pretty good. So you have to be the lobbyists. They'll be stuck out there. They won't be able to move. Um, so... We're going to have a convention. Somewhere, delegates will go, and they will get together with the structure. And I'm, I'm not going to get too detailed because this, these things will morph a little bit as this comes out if we do it. They'll have what's called plenary power. They have the ability to do everything. So remember, the governor's out of the picture now. Legislature's out of the picture. Guess who else is out of the picture? That wildly left activist judicial system we have full of leftist judges because our ABA picks the judges for us, and it's wildly left. One of my pet peeves. And... They don't get any say in this. It's you now at the convention with plenary powers to do whatever you believe is right. Now you'll have a convention set up, you'll have committees, you'll have all that kind of stuff, and guess what will happen? People will produce and they will propose constitutional amendments, whatever they are, PFD, spending cap, name the thing, whatever it is, judicial reform, abortion language reform, name your thing, okay? And those things will be proposed. They'll go through the committee process, they will make it to the floor or they won't. If they make it to the floor and they get a 50% plus one vote, they pass. And when the convention's over, they move on to go to an election at the next election, okay? The last vote that you have, and I hope for some of you that may be on the fence, this is the thing that pushes you across the edge to say yes, is that whatever comes out of the convention, you are the final arbiter of that. You are the final judge because it has to go before you in the next general election. Which means, if we, and this is what I was telling you minutes ago, a while ago, if we do something stupid, I say we, whoever's there, guess what? I'm like, they say, we're going to take away the Second Amendment. Alaskans aren't going to vote for that. They say, we're going to do X, Y, Z, name the thing. Alaskans aren't going to vote for that. I'm here to tell you right now, as hard as the, in the legislature to get some things passed, if it's what I call those niche issues, the smaller issues that are groups that are not, doesn't affect everybody or they have big disagreements, I don't believe they're going to pass. You're not going to get the votes. And then, frankly, folks, if it makes it somehow through the, uh, the, the process, I don't think the people are going to pass it. Because you can look and see what takes place, right? That's how the structure and the flow of this would work. Generally speaking, like I said, don't hold me to it because some of this can change a little bit. I want to make a couple of the points. First, um, the fringe stuff, right? Everybody always talks about the fringe things we're going to have. Like I, as I've told you, I don't believe that we're going to see... The fringe issues, and I call them fringe, and I don't mean to make them unimportant. I'm saying if it's not something that affects everybody, I don't think it's going to make it through. That's one of the things, again, they sell as fear. 
all these things are going to happen. And I'm trying to explain to you why I don't think they will. Okay? Because you're not going to get enough people to do that. And remember, because we're electing delegates from across the state, it's different. The delegate from Juneau not going to look like the delegate from Matsu. The delegate from certain parts of Anchorage isn't going to look like the delegate from East Fairbanks. Right? Or West Fairbanks. Because West Fairbanks is blue. East Fairbanks is red. Okay? Good news is it's not really any blue, really, in Matsu. A bubble, a little blue bubble, but it's okay. Down there. <laughs> And I've got my, my, I always laugh. I, I was saying that thing, it's my hippie commune because I have to tell Keaton, right? So that's kind of blue too. Downtown, at least. So, first of all, I trust you to do the right thing, okay? Um, and I don't trust us anymore. I reject the fear mongering, right? I'm using my own words here for a second, uh, because of the fact that I don't believe the state is hardcore blue. It's not hardcore red. It's not even really purple. Alaska is a libertarian state. Alaska is kind of leans conservative, it leans red, especially national elections and downstream, but it's really not a red state per se when you look at who we are. And you, who, does anybody know the numbers on undeclareds? How many there are? I figured exactly, it was like 267,000. Anybody want to know how many Republicans there are? Like 140,000? How many Democrats? Like 75? Point is, there's more undeclareds as a group than even Republicans and Democrats combined. Now they lean a little bit right, a little bit, but we're not a Republican state. We're certainly not a Democrat state. So you see my point, folks, is that as we vote and go through this, especially for those of us that are conservative, the best case is it slides a little bit to the right. And in which case, it'd probably be kind of a center line document, not a really a right document. It's not going to happen. The votes aren't there. The structure's not there. That's what I'm trying to tell you when people sell this fear to you. Um, uh, yeah, Ooh, went right past that point. Uh, let's see. Sorry, got to catch up with my notes here. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. So, um, we need a convention. We need the convention for you to take the power back. We need a convention to put a stop on the brakes of the power and the money that has been taken from you. And the power players have done it. This is not dangerous like they say it is. There's risk in anything we do, folks. There's risk getting up out of bed in the morning and falling down your stairs and breaking your neck. There's risk probably much more so getting in your car and driving down the highway to Pinyon with Valley than just about anything else. Everything has some risk. I acknowledge that. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I'm not saying they won't flood the state with money and try to do stuff. I'm telling you that the structure as set up, how the votes would be cast, who the delegates are going to be and how they're going to be elected is going to prevent that. And I will tell you my one last thing for, because most of this crowd, I don't know if everybody is, most of this crowd is conservative, right? Does anybody know the number of outflow and inflow immigration every year in Alaska? It's about 40,000. It's how much? 730,000 people in here in 10 years, half this state has changed. And do you know where they're leaving and going to and where they're coming from? Anyone want to take a guess? Most of the people are leaving are good blue collar workers. They're going to Texas, North Dakota, anywhere greener pastures. You know who's coming up here? People from the left coast, California, Oregon, Washington because they see Alaska as a big national park in this great place. You think they're gonna want any of the things that most of you care about 10 years from now? Do you think this state is gonna be red or even lean red 10 years from now? No, it will not. I am here to tell you, my gut tells me that in 10 years we will have lost this state unless we can change things in the constitution to put us on a better path. And some of these things can be done legislatively, some of these things in a constitutional amendment. But I'm telling you, folks, if we don't have the Constitutional Convention now, I don't believe there will ever be another chance. I believe this state will be something that none of us recognize 10 years from now. Many of us don't want to live it anymore because of where it goes. So just look at Anchorage as an example, okay? So um, I think that's, I'm going to look at my wife and hopefully not put her in the spot, but she hears me rant all the time about this because I've been passionate about it for some time, arguing. Am I, is any big points I'm missing? No? And she doesn't even want to say no. She's like, no, nope, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> She'll say it once we get in the truck. Oh, I forgot this. I know we do it all the time. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. And I know there's some questions about maybe RCV or, or binding caucus. I will tell you this, folks, uh, just a, a little hint before we get into questions. The binding caucus is rearing its ugly head again. And I haven't had to talk about it because we didn't have it in the Senate. Sharon shaking her head in the back. I know David's here somewhere. He's gone through it too. And I'm hearing people talk about like Dan Sadler. You know, he was in the house before, and now he's trying to run back against Sharon, actually. And uh, he's out there telling people, binding caucus, binding caucus. I'm telling you folks, don't want a binding caucus because it's part of where the evil of this state is unethical. It's quite frankly a felony 
Because it says right in our books that it is a felony if, if you ask a legislator to promise to vote for or against anything they're allowed to vote for or against. It's a felony. And what does the binding caucus do? Makes you promise your vote for two years for something of value. Are you going to tell me that being a finance co-chair, having billions of dollars flow through your hands that you dole out to the state is not something of value? Are you going to tell me a chairmanship that decides the policies and the laws we live under is not something of value? Having more staff at your fingertips to do things or a bigger office is not something of value, but that's what you exchange when you agree to a binding caucus. And then you have the excuse to say, well, I, should, I had to vote that way because the binding caucus, laziest legislators ever, ridiculous. And it's rearing its ugly head again, and some people want it. And, they're gonna, and you should be asking the question of your candidates, do you agree with the binding caucus and are you going to join one? Because I'm here to tell you, folks, all this other stuff we're talking about, too, if those rear their ugly head again in the House and the Senate, some of the things here are done. They're done. Because legislators are going to sell their soul and not be able to vote that way. Or I go and agree to it and then have to vote no and get kicked out again. And I got a senator that's sitting there with no committees and no power. That's right. Understand that. I think I've covered all the big stuff. And nobody said anything, so I'm going to stop because the timing is 8, which and we're close and go to questions. People line up there line up or shout a question and I'll repeat it if they don't want to get up that's fine so everybody hears what the question was well they need to talk to the microphone so the people on the videos can hear oh, good so point. you've got to line up here that's or cool. you can raise your hand and I'll come to you uh, after the line time to cut it off Edna or you just want to keep an eye on it for me yeah no I, I think we're fine we can go with them easily until 8.30 okay so if they hear to be the time hack well I'll have Edna cut it off at that point and if I have not answered a question please like I said for tonight just because of time, I want to keep it focused on the Constitution Convention and maybe RCV because it's in front of us. Uh, but if there's questions I didn't answer or aren't clear, please ask them. Because I don't just want you to know. I want to get it on video and I want to be able to share it. I want people to see this. And I'm going to ask that because Michelle will ask me if I don't remember. When this video is posted, please share it. Share it in your own social media circles. Get anybody else to put it out there. Ask the questions. Make your own pitch about it. Do whatever you think. But please help us share this. Because, folks, we're not going to get the message from the ADN. They're not going to share this. The Juno Empire is not going to share it. The Fairbanks News Miner is not going to share it. KTUU is not going to share it. They don't want it. The unions aren't going to put it out to their members. They don't want it. So I'm asking you folks, there's 100 people in here, I don't know, whatever, 150. If even you shared it with three or four people, that's 1,000. And if three or four more people share it, that's 10,000 and 20,000. And the next day, you know people are hearing the message. So please help me with that. All right. Well, your last statement kind of leads into my question. It isn't to do with the Constitutional Convention, but Senator Showers, do you, would you say, would you believe or say this is a true statement, that the root of our problem, okay, the root of it, is that we the people have not stood up and done our job. We have the power, but we don't use it, or if we do, we give up. Uh, Dick, you're 100% correct. That is the root of much of our problems. You have always had the power in this country. We have stopped using it as a people because we are either lazy. I'm saying about me too. I'm not accusing anybody of anything I won't accuse myself of. We have been lazy. We have been distracted. We have been too busy living our lives. We have let the other side decide for us because we go, oh, that's about, I'm not really going to get in that community council. I don't want to run for the planning board and the school board. Guess what? That's where it starts, folks. This stuff starts down here, and the other side is smart enough to know that. They fill those with the wrong people who work their way up in policies. You go, how come I got a tax rate increase? How come I got a green belt behind my house? Because you didn't get involved. That's right. You didn't do it. And you've had the power the whole time, my friend. And you know it, and we know it. It's what the Constitution says. That's why I started this speech with that. It's right in the book that we live off of. We have the power. We don't use it. Exactly. The convention takes it back and they are scared to death of where that takes us scared to death and we are doing something we're getting rid of the voting machines right in the managers you might be the pilot we're, program that shows how we're, that we're works yeah, believe it. <laughs>
if our elections and accounting is done properly. Thank you. So a, here's the good news. I don't know if it's good news, but I will say it. I will answer it this way: if they if they cheat, if they make it so that there's no convention, well, we just lost the convention. I agree, it's important. That would be not the best answer for us, but at least it's not. You know, giving us a Democrat governor, we should have a Republican or something to that effect. So while I will never rule that out as an option, at least the good news is it's not going to be, it's not disastrous for us if they, if it happens so that we don't get it, if that makes sense. Now, all that being said, a comment to that is that you guys are well aware in here of election integrity stuff. And I had many, that's why I threw it out there for people because I think people go, we wanted all this stuff. And so do I. I put it in the bill. That's why I was a white supremacist and a racist and everything else I got called by an ADN and all, everybody else got blasted and didn't have any co-sponsors in the Senate. Not one. Did it all by myself. Never got that. Had to work with Democrats at the end of the session to get try to get it across the finish line. Okay, where are we really with election integrity and who's really supporting it, right? Because I took it in the chin for years on this without very little help. My point to that is I agree with you there's a lot to be done and there may be things we can do inside a constitutional convention as well. We'd have to look and see how that is, and is there enough support for it? Because like I said, it still becomes a more niche issue. Although I will tell you, election integrity, election reform starts to bubble up a little bit, you know, in that. Because even Democrats, some of them want certain things, right? And they don't argue certain things about the system, right? Like the, the voter rolls are inflated. They don't argue that because they know it's true, right? They don't argue automatic voter registration hasn't caused problems because the data is there, right? So there are things we can certainly do. Um, with that, and I wish I was going to remember what my second point was because Richard said something about the RCB and the, gone by. Oh, the ballots. I want to just tell this to you guys, not because I am trying to influence it, I want, but I want you to hear it. In all of the hearings that we had over election integrity, because you know I've spent, I don't even know how much of my life I've spent on this now, but um, a lot. And the Pacific Interest Legal Foundation, Heritage Foundation, many of you know who those are, and very conservative groups, you know, organizing whatever. Um, I was kind of surprised because they were adamant, I mean absolutely adamant, where'd Richard go, who's in there somewhere, I missed him, um, they were adamant that paper ballots are, and I won't use the language because we're in church, but they said it's like a, a dictator's dream, because they can stuff ballot boxes and they're very hard to track, etc. Pros and cons to everything, but their point was that machines could be okay if you were able to track them, and that's why we were looking and trying to go down the path of investigating open source software and hardware. So that people like Brian Endel, I don't know if Brian's here, but they can, our IT experts, have total access. There's no hidden stuff, there's no proprietary. One of the problems with Dominion, among others, is they won't let us see it. We have no access to it. I don't know what's going on with that. I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable. This is too important to our democracy, our republic moving forward. So I could live with paper ballots, because that's what we have, and machines if they were open source software and hardware and we had complete access at all times. I could live with that. I'm not saying that's what we should do. I'm saying I can live with that. But I wanted to throw that out for this particular case because it's something we're investigating as an option because I don't know what we're going to be able to do. I'll tell you right now, I don't want Dominion anymore. I'm done with that. I'm done with proprietary hiding stuff and not telling me anymore and having to access absolutely not. I don't trust it. I'm done with it. I could go open source, maybe. Or we see how it goes here with paper ballots and we go back to hand counts and we get good regulations and run it. Maybe it does okay. I'm okay with that too. But I just want people to be aware the people that do this, you know, that are very experienced, that have been doing it for decades, are really he hesitant on um, just paper ballots because of the, you know, stuffed ballot boxes and other stuff that happens too. So we got lots of issues. Anyways, I'll move on just because of time. Sorry. Mike. Mike, two things. One, the, one of the counters to this that I hear a lot. Well, the state legislature doesn't follow the Constitution anyway. So why would I want to do a constitutional convention, even if we get some good stuff in the Constitution, the legislature's not going to listen to it and not going to follow it. That's, that's the first, first aspect. Second aspect, though, is since the state legislature is going to be doing a lot of the rules making and everything else, I know that uh, David Eastman's got to be a bill that he had, where he, had, he listed, where you have the districts and judicial districts, and I think the kind of the concept is like 55, uh, 55, 60 delegates. I would say that when I looked at that, it was totally confusing. Let's make it simple. Two people per district. We have 40 districts statewide, that would be 80 people, and one district, one vote. That way you have the two people that are going, you may have a you may have a liberal, you may have a conservative in those two. 
and they want how they, they have to work with each other. And then when it comes down to those constitutional convention votes, it's one district, one vote. But that way, I think it would be a lot, lot less confusing to the judiciary district and districts and all this. But it, plus, this board could be more equal because I, I know historically we had what one Alaska Native in the, the original Constitution. We had no women. We had all. We had all. And it was all white except for the one Native. Yeah. So this way, it would be it would be uh, across the board. So. That's the two issues. Okay, I'll try to answer them uh, fast as I can here. So the first, we'll go first and then backwards. Um, I'm open to anything that works, Mike. I, it's an open structure. I do want to highlight again to people that the Constitutional Convention delegates will have plenary power. So that's why I kind of highlight to you. You go, well, the legislature's going to have its fingerprints on it. Yeah, until they get there. And they go, pound sand. We're not doing that. They don't have to. They can set up and do what they want. Understand that. So the judicial impact, the legislative impact, governors, all that dark money, they can do and say whatever they want until they show up and close those doors and start, all bets are off because they don't have any more influence. They can't tell them what to do. They can set up the structure and do it how they want. So understand that. Decide what you want about voting yes or no, but I want you to understand the facts behind it and how it will play out. In regards to your second question, or the first one, I guess, is, um, oh shoot, remind me. <laughs> this is my brain flew that way. But what was the first one? Right, the Constitution. Okay, so here's how I respond to that, Mike. In theory, you're not necessarily wrong. But what I have seen with my own eyes is that the law, statutes, whatever, we don't have to follow those. Do what we want. And the courts have essentially said we can do that pretty much, right? There's a number of laws we don't follow. And when I talk about the PFD, I'll have a certain say, well, we don't follow this law. And I'm like, and so I think they expect me to say, well, okay. But you're like, why not? I fire right back. Follow it. If you don't like it, change it. That's how it's supposed to work. That's one of the reasons I'm stuck in the statutory PFD. If you want to change it, change it. If that's the law, I'll follow it. But I'm tired of not following the law, whatever it says. And have the political courage to change it. That's number one, okay? Um, but regarding the Constitution, so far, by and large, that has been a hurdle that is so high that we really haven't jumped over that. And the courts have generally upheld any constitutional challenges where they try to do stuff. And I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying they're not going to try to squeak one by. But I'll tell you right now, Mike, one of the reasons they're afraid of a constitutional convention and enshrining the PFD and the Constitution is because they know that is a bar so high that the courts probably aren't going to overrule that. They look at the statutes and the Constitution a little bit differently. I'm sorry they do. That's my read on what I see. So I'm not going to argue that they don't try to do some stuff and they, they, they bent a lot of rules around it. But that bar is pretty doggone high. And, uh, and I just, and, and finally, what else are we going to do? I mean, that's it. I mean, so short of armed rebellion and storming the legislature, they've got to have, you know, whatever. I mean, how are you going to change it? That's the, that's the highest thing we have. We do that and see what happens. Mike, if that doesn't work, plan B. We'll get to that. I don't know if you can answer this question or you can even help with this issue. Uh, with the whole election and the ballots and that kind of stuff, I mean, we ended up in this ranked choice voting because people looked at that and went, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds like something I should do. They wrote it... Um, Surreptitiously. And that would be a good word. Uh, so if we manage to get to the point where we have the, the everybody voting and saying, yes, we want this in the Constitution, or no, we don't, who would actually write those questions and say, we want our PFD to go to we the people? Point blank, yes or no. Who would be the one that would write those questions? The questions are the actual amendments. No, when you get to the polls and you, right. you're in their little booth and you're reading what it says, and it says, do you want a PFD to you or do you want it to the government? And you have to say yes or no. How do we get it put into third grade level that people can answer it and know what they're actually voting on so we don't end up with this ranked choice stuff again. I see yeah. what you're saying. Well, think about how this was written. The citizens that wanted it, there weren't many of those. It was mostly dark money, people from outside. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know if there's any Lisa Murkowski supporters in here, whatever. I'm not. But Lisa, her staff, and Scott Kendall in Alaska for Better Elections, I've done the background and dug on it. PIs have paid people to get the background data. 
It was designed and created in this specific case for her in the top four so Lisa could get reelected by not having a primary because they knew the Republican Party was not was going to censor her and not, not support her. And so it was designed to make sure she could put her name in anyways, and then hopefully, based on the moderates and the others, be able to get over the, the hump. And she probably will, based on polling data. It's probably likely Lisa is going to win this election based on the numbers if they hold up as it is right now. They wrote it. And they give that to the initiative and then the, the division of elections with the lieutenant governor who's responsible for it. They decide what that question is going to be. They write it, approve it, and then it goes on the ballot. So that's your answer to that. So it depends on who's writing it, and then, but it still has to be approved. And they'll let that go. I mean, they, depending on their ideology, there's people at DOE that are not exactly right a center. I can tell you the one at the very top is not. That person is ooh, over there on the left side. All right? I know it because I deal with them. And for those that have been in here with the division of election stuff, deal with the lieutenant governor. The Shabaka report. There's people here who know I fought for that one and can't get it. I got a report handed to me. Half of it was blacked out. Oh well. So not much you can do about it, or how do we, the people, get that task? You would have to be a part of driving an initiative, and then you would be in the in the driver's seat. If you started an initiative and get it throughout the state because they're expensive and manpower intensive, you could write that question, get it approved, and put it on the ballot. That, that's kind of a short thing. Time. time will be time will be required. <laughs> a lot. All right, I haven't been in Alaska terribly long, just about eight years, and in listening to the, the discussions about the PFD and the Constitution and the budget and, you know, and the state's income going up and down, um, I think I finally have started to understand, it seems like Dunleavy and it seems like your position is that it's better to give the money directly to individual Alaskans and then let them decide what to do with it rather and then cut the government services. Is that a fair um, assessment that if that you were talking about there's a lot of power involved with distributing the money and if you have less money to distribute there's less power and so it's better to hand individual money to each individual person and then have less money funneling through the government? Okay, so that's why I looked at the clock to make sure I have time to answer that question. Um, it's a little bit of a joke. So, yes and no. And I'm not going to equivocate, I'm going to explain why I say that. So, number one, the PFD statute, that's the law. As I said a few minutes ago, we follow the law, but we don't. So the first thing is, I could care less what the amount is, but I care about following the law. So the law says it's going to be X amount. This should have been $4,200 a person this year, roughly. That's the statute. I want to follow it. It's just that simple. If we have to follow it for something or we change it, so be it, I'll follow that law. So that's number one. And I'm not refuting your argument. Just saying when people say, oh, well, you just want to give that money to the people and, and, it's, and you know, in exchange for government. No, I don't. I want to follow the law. That's number one. So I, I reject this argument that somehow because I want a PFD that's supersized, which is a lie in of itself because it's what the law dictates, it has nothing to do with government services. It's divorced from it. The PFD shouldn't be discussed in the budget, ever. No. It doesn't belong there because that's the law. So I want to follow it just to be crystal clear. That's what it is. If we agree in a, in a fiscal plan and other stuff and it changes, so be it to balance the budget and do what we have to do. Regard, and that's why I wanted to be very clear on that, of delineating those things. That PFD to me has nothing to do with our budget, it's government services or anything else. Government services, it used to be actually until 2017, they changed the language when Walker started taking the PFD arbitrarily, Governor Walker previous, I don't know when you, when you got her exactly. And it was what was in the military we call pass-through money. It would be like, here's your budget, it goes right through, you don't get your hands on it, can't touch it. That's what it is, law says it goes and gets distributed to all people. That's what we did for almost 40 years. Then he came in and whoop, turned everything upside down. The state's been in chaos ever since. Thank you very much. So the budget itself should never have anything to do with it, like I said a minute ago. But what we need for services should be determined by us as a legislative body and say, here's what the agencies need. Chris starts with the governor's budget. He says, here's the budget. Here's what I think we need. Here's what I propose. The legislature gets his hands on it. They cut some, add some, do whatever they do. Then we pass that out. And the governor signs it, line and vetoes those things. Those should be completely divorced from each other. What we have done, though, the people that want to take the PFD to pay for government, when I went back to that you know, hour ago where I said, hey, they want to take it, they want the power, they want their hands and the money, they've realized they can take that. The courts have said they could. So they can now conflate the PFD with the budget. Oh, it's a cost to government now. 
And oh, they try to tell you, well, if we have a PFD, then it's going to cut government services. No, no, it's not. That's not how it works. For example, this year, we paid a full PFD. Well, we could have, should have, right? We did, when it left the Senate anyways. And we fully funded the budget, right? And we also added money to the capital budget. We, each, we actually put some money away in savings. And um, all of that was with zero deficit spending, not one. Why? Because we had extra money this year. I'm of the mindset, I'm like, if we have money and we need to spend it, roads, infrastructure stuff, okay, spend it. I'm also of the mindset, if we have money and we don't need to spend it, save it. But we haven't done that. And so what happened was, is over the last 10 years or so, we spent the CBR, the state, one of our big savings accounts, down from about $17 billion to basically zero. Why? Because they wouldn't cut government services. And when they started running out of that money, they started going after the PFT. So to me, those are separate and divorced issues. I don't want to even, I, I refuse to, that argument of trying to conflate those together. Um, but the budget, we have that battle every year by itself. And then we fund it. And that's what I said. I want that PFD protected. And then I have to go to you and I say, I want to grow government. But you're going to pay taxes to do it, and then you're going to tell me whether that's a good thing or not. Right now, what's been happening? We've been growing government unchecked because they're able to take the PFD from the people and add billions to the budget and grow government agencies, all because they haven't had to come to you to do it. It's easy. When I don't have to ask you, I can just do it. But if i got to come to everybody and go, I need your wallet, I need your wallet, I need your wallet, all of a sudden that's uncomfortable for me, and it gets harder. And that's the actual downward pressure on the budget so we don't grow unchecked. In addition to that budget battle, I put in like $1.5 billion in cuts. One of them was the forward funding for education. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Not because I'm against education. We need it. I'm all, I'm all for it. I'd like to see us be able to let that money follow the students of what they do. That's a whole different discussion, right? Different topic. Not going to go there tonight. But those cuts were designed to go, I, I don't want to see us forward funding things. We, we fight over this every single year. As we should. We're supposed to fight over it. So, long answer, that's why I looked at the clock, because you asked a really good question, but it's because they have been allowed to conflate the arguments and add it all together, so all of a sudden people start going, well, yeah, the PF, supersized PFT, that's, that's taking away government services. No, it's not, and it was never designed to. They've captured the narrative, and the press and the others that are in, aligned with them have spread that message, so people now buy it that, well, if I'm going to have my full PFT, that means I'm not going to be able to use X government services, right? Baloney. That's, that's not the way it is. And I ask people all the time, I say, when's the last time you called the police? I've never called them. When's the last time you called for a fire truck? Most people would say no. When's the last time you used uh, any government services besides, I, you wonder the one I use the most? I go to the borough to pay my taxes. I'm like, that guy kind of sucks. It's not really a government service. They're taking my money. That's where my services are. And I say, oh, well, what about roads and bridges, right? I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> Rows and bridges, I got it, yes, but you also pay taxes for that already. Because most of our money for those things comes from the federal government, which we were taxed for, by the way. Amen. And for every gallon of gas you pay, you're being taxed for. Yep. Nothing's free, folks. So, that's about, so I hope that answers your question. Not against the government stuff that we do, but how we've done this has really upended the process. And it's conflated things that should have never been conflated. It's allowed for unrestrained growth. And unfortunately, right now, they got an easy answer. I don't have to come to you to ask for it, and I think that's wrong, and I think it's hurting us because it's going to put this on our kids and grandkids. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the question. Dave? I need to take a breath. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> Your turn. Um, one quotable thing you said, and this is just the beginning of what I'm going to say. Felons, that's felons. That's disturbing to me because I used to work in the prison system. I feel like going back and apologizing to the, to the felons I worked with. When our legislators can get away with it. That's what the felons were actually saying. Look what they're doing. Yeah. We, we, have, we have a contingent of people that are very, very uh, lepers. Yeah. And then others that are elitist. And they shouldn't be. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before I started with this was, you know, policy is, or uh, excuse me, um, personnel is policy. It's the quality of the people that we need. We don't need just competent people. We need people of character. That's who needs to be leading us. And that's where this is going to lead to. So last Tuesday night at the borough meeting, around 25 people testified about their distrust in the election process, and demanded that the assembly resolve to remove the Dominion machines. 
This testimony was driven by a series of events, including stolen identities, court judges changing laws not under their authorization, executive and legislative branches abrogating their, their authority, Kevin Meyer and the Division of Elections disregarding the people's voice of concern, and what appears to be elections stolen, both in state and across the country. The results of no confidence in this system is at an all-time low. 8% of the people voted last election in this valley. You, Senator Schauer, graciously stepped up to represent me when you learned of my history as a whistleblower in the state of Alaska. They retaliated against me and fired me. You tried to contact the Department of Corrections, Nancy Dahlstrom, the commissioner. Her response to you was to stonewall and not get back to you. I'm very familiar with this type of activity because this has become the norm when state officials are being questioned on their actions. Very quick. Nancy Dahlstrom did it to you, very similar to what Kevin Meyer did to us. So my question for you is, is Nancy Dahlstrom, who is now proposing to be the Lieutenant Governor to take over our elections again, is she, yeah, you know where I'm going, is she a qualified candidate for this position? And let me be clear, I'm not just asking, is she competent? What I'm asking is, do you think she has the qualities to be a public servant considering the way she stonewalled you on my behalf? Thanks, Ted. So, the answer to that question is, I don't know. I mean, I will tell you that I am not happy. I'm not happy with what Lieutenant Governor Meyer did. I never got the answer and resolution to your problem that I asked Commissioner Dahlstrom for. So, my inclination is gonna say right now, I am concerned. I will give you a, um, an answer that is the best one I ever heard when Trump got elected. And it was my friend that was a two-star back in DC because he was up at 2.30 in the morning, called me after they called it for Trump. I said, what the heck are you doing up awake? He's like, we're all awake because they were more concerned about Hillary, right? And they were, oh. But he said, and I said, so okay, so what's your result or what's your answer? He's like, I am relieved yet concerned. He was relieved it wasn't Hillary, right? As I would say, I would be relieved it's not Kara or Walker again, yet I am concerned of who we're putting back in and what they're going to do and are they going to follow their promises. I have not yet talked to her. I have not yet had a chance to ask the questions I need to ask about election integrity and other issues, which will include yours because I haven't given up. You know that. We talk about this every time we see each other. I don't know, Dave. I don't know. Um, I fear that the answer is going to be like it often is that we're picking the, the, less, the lesser of two evils, or, you know, as the saying goes, because I don't know what else to do and I don't have that choice. So I'm going to have to work with that person, whoever it is, um, but I will be somewhat like my friend was on the night of the election when we know who it is. And my answer might be, I am relieved and I'm concerned. Hey there, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I just have a quick uh, point that I want to make about fear. Uh, we heard a lot about fear tonight and fear motivates people in, in various ways. Um, when uh, I used to hear that elections were pointless and that voting was pointless, I used to point out, well, uh, don't underestimate how much worse things can get. Uh, and I hear about the, uh, how desperately the ADN and various groups don't want this convention. I hear about the many people who are sent in the hallways, the lobbyists, and so on, and the laws that they break. And we live in a state where, um, well, in a world where, unfortunately, not everybody who breaks the law gets caught. Um, so when I think about bribing delegates or something like that, uh, well, what, what motivates me in terms of fear? Fear here, uh, you can either be convinced that you don't need to worry, or you can be convinced that they're going to do absolutely everything that they can, and then some, and you have to beat them anyway. Um, so I, I sort of feel like, you know, it's good to have this inner party, especially now, debate, and that's great. Uh, if, the, if and when the time comes that there's a convention, then we have to, we have to organize and fight. We have to, or else uh, I'm, 
I'm not convinced that they won't try to, because there's all this money, there's, it, there's all this fear on the other side. They're not just gonna do nothing. They're, they're, they're going to be as, you know, the rapscallions that they are. And they're, they're going to, to try to put themselves in and get every inch that we let them have, uh, as they so often do. So it seems to me that the, the big issue is if you know we, 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 we resolve this amongst ourselves and then if it happens, we gotta fight. We gotta we gotta come up with a plan and we need to, to expect them to do absolutely everything vile and foul as they usually do and still beat them. Um, and if if is there a plan you know, what sort of plans do we have for that? I guess is my question. Thank you. Okay, good. I was wondering if we're gonna get to a question there, Rich, because that's a good statement. All right. So I'll try to go quickly because of time. I still want we got a couple more folks here. Is that I think it was Winston Churchill said it. I have not yet begun to fight, or we have not yet begun to fight. I'm just getting started, folks. And I hope that over time and we vote for this, then the fight will really be on. Right? I mean we've got to fight to get there. We're gonna to have to fight after. But I will tell you this, I mean, up to the point of if we have a constitutional convention, I may very well step back and go, I resign. Put somebody else in my seat because I gotta be there for this. This is too important. And run the structure. But just like I'm trying to do, I think I said that earlier on the radio or something, I said I'm already meeting with House members and others trying to build a coalition and go go into Juno, assuming I go back, with a with a unified message and a unified plan. I'm tired of getting there and going, now we need to organize. I'm like, no, we should organize a week after the election's over. We should have a plan. We should step into Juno day one, get the job done by 30, 90 days. I'm out of there with a budget pass. I'm sick of this. Sit there for three months and have briefing after briefing and do nothing. It drives me nuts. Absolutely not. Yes. I'm thinking that uh, the Alaska Constitution provides us for four things. Correct me on the last two because I don't remember them. Education, public safety. What's the others? Shoot, I can look at it myself and go back to it now. All right. Beyond that, all the other stuff is glitter. All right? It's not in the Constitution. Wait, wait, wait. The Supreme Court says it's right. Yeah. A couple things, just saying. Sorry. The Supreme Court, you were right. The Supreme Court is primarily conservative until it comes to elections and that's where they stray now one thing scares the heck out of me about a constitutional convention well actually there's two I've had many Republican legislatures tell me that they do not even begin to write a bill or approach legislation without considering the Democrats and what they'll go for. That's given, in my mind, that's given like 85% of the battle away already. Okay. Before the fight, before the first shots ever fired, number one. <clears throat> number two, as you were in Juneau in 2020, the last couple of days of the legislature, budget hadn't been passed yet, COVID was on the edges of, they were afraid we were going to shut down Juno. Half our legislators bailed on us. That's what scares me. All right. Um, Tom, was there a question there? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't actually hear one. Before I should go to the next one, because I think some, uh, somebody else, Margaret, was up there too. Um, you know how I operate, Tom, on this one. And like SB 39, the election integrity bill, had everything we wanted, which is why I was a white supremacist and a racist and blah, 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 because I put it all in there. As time went on, and I would be happy to sit on that, but as we both know, if I don't do something different, it's not going to, I can get it through the Senate, but it's going to die. Um, and it would have. So there is a time, I believe, that you can make those compromises on a bill to get things that you still want as much as you can get. That happens. That's why we did what we did at the end, to try to move something, because there were important things. But I also agree with you, and this is like negotiating one-on-one. -on -one. I don't go in and say, you know, because if I'm going to negotiate with you and I go, I'm going to buy a house, right? And I go, well, you know, my bottom line, as low as I'll go, is 200000 You know, when I started 300000 Well, that's a negotiating tactic. So, okay, I'll offer you 200000 right? You don't negotiate that way, right? You say, I want all of this. I want a million dollars. And he goes, well, I'll give you a three fifty. You go, oh, cool, that's more than I wanted. So I get it, and I understand that. And I don't disagree with you. A lot of the tactics by many is like, well, 
like you said, write the bill for what I think is going to pass. No, you write the bill for what you want. If you have to pare it back over time, that may be the compromise you make to get something done. That's how I believe we should operate. I don't disagree. That's not how we operate. And we're worried about the optics. We're worried about what people think. And I'm going, I can't say the language. I'm not going to say it. Sorry. I'll keep it to myself. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm a business owner, family man, 30 year Alaskan. Um, about three years ago, I was not involved in any, I was just doing my own thing. And I want to speak to every single one of you. You have the leadership ability. Every single one of you. You have a phone, you have contacts, and you have the ability to group up. They hate the fact that you're going to group up and think together and talk together. My question to you is, inside the Constitutional Convention, how do they develop the inner, the inner workings? How, who is going to be making the decisions in, in there? You know, there, there's a there's a structure that is going to happen within them. So who's going to be deciding who are the the top tier? This and so what I would recommend is look at that Alaskan Citizens Guide for the Constitution yep. that Edna put up before. Read it to get a primer on it. You can go back and read a few. You don't have to go through all the detail I did for that because, like I said, I'm trying to be, I've been trying to get smart on how it works so I can talk about it and explain to people why I don't be afraid of it. Um, you'll get that structure. If you started just from a baseline and said, oh, it's going to look something like the legislature with people in charge, and, and I say in charge, not ones making decisions, but like setting up the committees and who's in it and how things are going to be moving through the process. If you start as your baseline with that, that's kind of a structure that would be similar to give you an idea of how somebody's going to make a proposal. It's going to go through committees. It's going to work its way through committees until they decide, okay, it's time to put it on the floor for a vote. So it's going to be very similar to that. But what I will tell you, remember, and this is where I have to be a little careful because there's no definitive, there's not like a guide that says, Constitution Convention, here's how you do it. It doesn't exist, right? We don't have that, which is why they say it's got to be as close as possible in initial structure to the original Constitutional Convention. So if you go back and read, which is why I say do that, it gives you an idea what the structure looks like. But remember, I also have to say this again, they have plenary power. They can get there and the legislature says, by law, we're going to set these things up and do this stuff. And they get there and go, yeah, whatever. This is how we're going to do it. They have that plenary power to do it as they see fit. And I actually think that's better because it's going to be citizens, not legislators that's been steeped in all of these procedures. And, oh, we've always done it that way because that's part of our problem. So it's, is it going to be Robert's Rules of Order? Or is it yes. Be, yeah. They'll then, use the same kind of procedures. And that's why I said think of the legislative session, how it kind of works as a, as a primer. And then the leadership is going to be decided within that. Once the doors are closed, the leadership is going to be decided within the They will vote session. on it and, and decide for themselves who's going to be in charge of what and go through it. So it's very similar to that, if that makes sense. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And Margaret. by the way, don't forget Margaret. I know she was up here somewhere, so if Margaret's still up here, she had a question, so, okay. Margaret, ask it if you don't mind, just because she was, she, I know she sat down waiting. Go ahead. I, I'll repeat it for everybody. Okay, so Margaret's question was, who's going to decide what goes into the Constitution? And that's why I pointed at her. Because the reality is, it's you. It's whoever you send are going to be the ones that propose constitutional amendments. Those will be the people that will then push for and try to get them through the convention, whatever they are. And then that will be sent to you in the next general election to vote on, yes or no, whether they pass. So the convention delegates, Margaret, will be the ones, excuse me, I got hiccups, will be the ones that will decide what those amendments may look like, they'll get legal advice, they'll write them up like a normal constitutional amendment would look, and then they'll take them to the floor for a vote. If it, if it survives the process, it goes to the floor in the convention, they vote on it, 50% plus one, it's going before you, and then again, that's why I pointed at you, you're the final one. If you don't like it, don't vote for it. That's, the, that's how it will work, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? So here's one question I have left that I've gotten multiple answers from different sources. I am not 100% on this yet. What I prefer, and I believe the option is going to be, is that each one will be presented to the people individually so you can vote them up or down. I have also been told, oh, that's not how it works. You've got to vote the whole thing up or down. I don't believe that's the case. And there's still arguments about this. So some of this may have to be set up in law when they decide the structure, right? 
Um, I don't want to see it all up or down because there may be good stuff and bad stuff, and I'd like to individually vote on it, right? But people have told me, well, it's got to be all of it. I go, well, then how do we do constitutional amendments when we, if the legislature was to pass them? They're individual. We vote on them up and down that way, just like a bill. We don't take Senate Bill 1 and 2, pass it separately, but vote on it together. That's not how it works. So I don't think that's the case, but I'm not 100% because I'm getting conflicting guidance, and I can't find anything so far, at least, that tells me for sure. And again, like I said, folks, I can't necessarily answer that because the process is going to change as, as the iterations get to the convention itself and the delegates and what they decide to do. It's not a perfect answer, I know. That's a good question. Wow. Sorry. Yes. Uh, for the question for the audience, Mike Coons asked, can the convention delegates make that decision? And the answer I have gotten is that is that is how it works. And that's what plenary power means. They have the ultimate power to make those decisions and how they're going to do it. And I believe they can even set that out as they go out that it will be individual questions. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, Mike, my name is Clayton Trotter. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a, a hypothetical question and and I uh, hope you'll permit that. That's OK. Let's assume that you have a constitutional convention. Let's further assume that a constitution is proposed to the people of Alaska, but it leaves the present system of judicial selection in place. What would be the result? Okay, so we have the convention, but they don't change anything, right? So it stays change, as it is. No, they don't change this judicial selection right. process. That stays as it is, right? It stays so, as it is. Um, well, the good news is that whatever we pass is constitutional. So you got that going for you, right? You look at the judiciary and go, all right, it's constitutional. You can't say it's unconstitutional. So there's that, even though somebody might try to battle that, whatever. I'm not too worried about that eventuality. I've talked to some folks on how that works out. It doesn't go well. So they could do that. And that's one of those, what I would call a niche issue. Some people are very concerned. I personally am. I'm the only one that I know of that filed a bill to change how we're going to select our judicial officers because I have seen this. I've said it before. I will say it tonight because we're here, because you asked. I had Senate Bill 14. I'm not aware of another bill or anybody that's figured this out so far. So I filed that bill two years ago. And what that bill does in our Constitution says the superior Supreme Courts will be selected by the Judicial Council. It's right in the Constitution. You can't change it. Lots of legislators over the years have tried to change the Judicial Council makeup so it would be more in favor of constitutional judges or maybe more in the middle, more moderate, not just a lot of left ones, right? So I looked at it and go, yeah, but it also says the lower courts are appointed by law. That's us, the legislature. It doesn't say Judicial Council. It says the ma so the magistrates, appellates, and district courts can be chosen by us. So I'm going, maybe we should do that. That's a legislative change. That's statutory. That's not the, the high bar of the constitutional change, the amendment. And I would like to see something like that. I'm going to take heed for saying that, but I also tell people this because I don't want to see justice for politics and all these other people get spun up. I think that issue is niche enough and there's going to be a balance enough because of how we're going to elect people from across the state. I don't think that's one that's going to get traction and move through. I think the process will be the same. I think we're going to have to fight that individually, either be a citizen's initiative to, to change how we select our judges or make them elected, put them accountable to the people, not just appointed and then they can stay for life. Um, or legislators, we change enough legislators and we, we vote to change it. And then we start taking it back. Okay, then if you permit me also a follow-up question. Um, Where's the boss? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Who is in charge of the judiciary in Alaska today? Who runs it? So the real answer to that would be the chief judge. I mean, if you're going to go by what they assume is the structure, it's going to be the chief justice of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court itself, because they basically run the system, they've got their, um, uh, their assistants that go through it, they make their own rules, um, they have the power over the Alaska Bar Association to select those judges coming up to the Judicial Council. Remember that the JC is three lawyers and three civilians, and the, break, the tie-breaking vote is always the Supreme Court Chief Justice. So four lawyers can decide and have, and throughout our history, have when there's been a tie, the Chief Justice makes the tie-breaking vote. Would you like to know who he's sided with every time? Those three lawyers. They have never once has the Chief Justice sided with the civilians when they said, we don't like that judge, he's too extreme, he's too whatever. So technically, what organization actually selects the judges for the Supreme Court? The Alaska Court? Bar Association. There you go. That's, all. That's why I'm doing it. I don't like have, a trade organization. Stay there. Sir, sir, can you come back? Oh. I think okay. Edda's got one for him. No, I don't. Uh, but he wanted to introduce himself, and I don't think we're going to take any more questions. It's 8:45, okay? Uh, 
but go ahead and we, I told John today that we would uh, take and give you a couple minutes to introduce yourself to the people. So since you're standing there, go ahead. My name's Clayton Trotter, actually it's Richard Clayton Trotter. I'm a professor at UAA. I teach business law and I have for the last almost 12 years now. Um, and if you'll permit me a short story, when I moved to Alaska some years ago, I was trying to decide how was, you know, if I was gonna make the move. And I was talking with the dean of the college and I said, look, you guys, you're not really offering me enough money to come up here. I mean, I'm breaking even. You don't move. I love Alaska, of course. That's what I would have come anyway. But, it, but, but the point is, he said, he said to me, well, you know, we have this thing called the PFD. And you'll be able to get like 15% more salary coming up here on the salary we're going to pay you because we got the PFD. So I moved up here, and then what did Governor Walker do? He, I have six children. He cut it in half. Now anyway, that's just a short story, which is one of the reasons I'm standing here tonight. But anyway, I'm a professor at the University of Alaska. I've worked for a United States district judge right out of law school. I have been the general counsel of the Justice Foundation, which is a public interest law firm based in San Antonio, Texas, with offices in Washington. And in the Dobbs case, we wrote four briefs. And I, I could I go into them, I could if I want to, I mean, we, thousands of hours. Yes, we put it, running for? I'm running for Senate. I'm running for Senate in uh, L, District L, which is Eagle River. And, but the point is, well, I got like 10 points, guys. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a professor, yeah, I got lecture. Anyway, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm Christian, I'm pro-life, I'm for minimal government. I am I've been a Republican since I was 14, and I'm so sick and tired of the stuff going on here. I finally decided to have to do something about it. So if you'll help me, I'll see what I can do. And I can't wait to get into the Senate and work with this man. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Well, my first opponent is Kelly Merrick. Wow. <laughs> That's about all I gotta say. Okay. <laughs> so, so then, uh, I'm looking at that. We're done. Cut it off. Yeah. No, no. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. I'll ask for the people that want to make announcements, and if we can get through those in the next five to seven minutes. Then we'll call the two of you back up to ask your question. And then, if, just for the group, I will stay. Uh, I will stay here. So Michelle and I usually do for a while. Usually it's us and the pastor trying to kick us out at ten o'clock because we're still yeah. You guys know how I am. So um, if you have other questions, you want to talk to the side. I'm not going to leave. So if there's more to this, it's fine. I'll stick around. Just that way, I don't have to get them out now. Okay. So if you want to hear from the senator again, make your announcements very short. Right. Right, I know you're a true conservative candidate for Massachusetts Assembly District 1. Uh, we've been leading the fight to uh, go to the assembly and get rid of these voting machines. We had very good turnout. We had, as um, uh, I think Dee had mentioned, we had 25 people come to the assembly, or somebody, uh, maybe it was Richard, mentioned that we had 25 people come to the assembly. Um, that's, that's a pretty big turnout for the assembly. We need some more. Uh, Dee was saying that, that, hey, you need to flood this place. You know? But we have traction. We've got. Uh, um, when are you going to meet again? Come on, let's wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Here, okay? Well, <laughs> when are you going to testify? We're going to get it out on Facebook and so forth. We don't have a date yet. So we're, we're meeting, we're going to present an, an argument or an argument for um, counting paper ballots to the assembly. And they need to have something on hand. Do you want solution. people to show up tomorrow night? No. Do you want people to show up on August 2nd? We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, bike goods. Hey, Matt. Uh, how many here are mature Elastos? Oh my god. So you're all uh, eat back members, right? Yeah. Okay, I have to watch this kind of, kind of line. Uh, the 20th of August, uh, we were hoping to have Mike there. Uh, we also got Jim Crawford. Uh, he's back in the hunting trip. We'll have him again. We're going to be doing the same thing. It's going to be here the 20th and 11th. So that's, we're going to be going over the same thing. And what I'm thinking about doing is if he's not here, I want to see if I can get the video and we'll play the video so we can get this again. I can't, I can't replicate what he just did. Uh, the second thing is... Time, somebody asked. When, uh, the 11, 11 a.m. on the 20th. Okay, okay. And uh, I can't advertise in, on, on Facebook, unfortunately. Okay. But it here. is here. 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 Uh, the second thing is, real quick, when it comes down to this Constitutional Convention, I am going to be a delegate. And I am going to be running for a delegate, and here's why I'm not going to use the dark money, because I'm going to use my own gas money, and I'm going to knock on doors. And everybody's going to know my name, and I want to find out where they stand on the Constitutional Convention. Judiciary, the judicial reform, PFD reform, things that we've been talking here, I want to be going for. So that's going to be coming up. So if you're, if you're thinking about doing it, do it. Because like he said, it's us, it's we the people that are going to be doing that constitutional convention. It's not going to be Tom Beige and those guys. Okay. okay. Are you going to read the book? Yes. Okay. I've got the book. <laughs> <laughs> It's a simple, save the date, Saturday, September 17th, for Alaska Medical Freedom Symposium. It's a follow-up from the frontline doctors that we had last year in Anchorage. We're going to equip and empower, empower Alaskans. So we're going to talk about uh, vaccine injury, what that looks like. What can you do about it? What can we gather those testimonies? Okay, so September 17th, Saturday, save the date. We're going to empower Alaskans. It's an Alaskan Medical Freedom Conference Symposium. Where, 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 the, uh, the location will be determined. Okay. Uh, will be announced later. Okay. Save the day. Perfect. Perfect example. Okay, Richard. Thank you for those that are uh, Palmer residents. We have uh, candidacy uh, uh, applications that we need to have signatures for. Do we have the mayor over there? We have. Councilwoman Anzalotti and myself, and we appreciate you guys' signatures. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> August 6th, out at the Willow Community Center, we will be hosting the Matsu Republican Women and the Valor Republican Women are hosting a campaign or candidate roundup. Everybody is invited to show up. There will be live music, a couple of food trucks, and you can mingle with all the candidates who show up. We've invited every um, legislative, Senate, Governor, U.S. Senate, and U.S. Congress. I don't know how many of them will show up, but if you are a candidate and you haven't responded yet to the email from Kathy McCollum, please do so. Thanks. Thank you. And what time, what time on that? Oh, sorry, 11 until 3. 11 to 3. <laughs> Sharon, do you have an announcement? I do. Okay, stand up so you can get involved. No, go ahead, CJ. Anybody else that has an announcement, will you stand up now so we can get the mic to you as quick as possible? So Sharon, stand up. Anybody else? Go ahead, CJ. I'm CJ Cohn, and this is my husband Eric, and we're having a fundraiser for Nick Baggage at our home on August 11th. If you would like to come get it with me, I'll give you directions or address or however. It's going to be uh, 5 to 7, or 5 to 7 30, I think it is. So come by if you want to support Nick. So we got to get him elected. Sharon Jackson, I'm writing for State House for Eagle River in Chupiac. Um, and yes, my no binding caucus. <laughs> 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 And 
Senate, House Representative. And I would like to invite you up because you know what? We're our neighbors and we're all in this together. So come on up. It's going to be at the Eagle River Community Center where the library is at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And Sunday at 5 to 7, I'm, there's going to be a meet and greet for myself and I can use all the support I can get. And it's going to be at high res across the street from Boondocks Sporting Goods. Everybody knows where Boondocks is. Directly across the street, 5 to 7. Thank you. Uh, August 1st, uh, George Roucher is having a fundraiser at uh, Lyle Downing's house. Um, you would have to go to his webpage or the District 29 webpage to find out a map and the time and the details. Okay, thanks, John. Anyone This is very quick and it's just something to give everybody a little sense of pride. Uh, I was suspended from Facebook for 30 days just for messaging Edna about this event. That was it. I did not know. It's, it's this event. And that was it. So I'm proud of that. I don't use it otherwise, but I just thought that was amazing. Apparently they really do care. They don't like that we do this. So everybody keep showing up. Okay, so the two people that want it, hurry, 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 come on. Terry, where are you at? Oh, there she While well, they're getting in line, uh, let me tell you, our next class will be a week from tonight. And uh, we have two of the gubernatorial candidates, uh, Kirka and, uh, and um, Bruce Walden, that are going to come and speak. So that's a week from tonight. Okay, here. Sorry. The wife was talking. I had to take that one. Yeah. I know where my bread's, bread's buttered. So yes, ma'am. Um, it just like smacked me up alongside the head this evening uh, before I came over. There's a lot of uh, reps and um, senators that are not running for re election. Do you think they're not running so they can run for a delegate on the Constitutional Convention? Terry, I don't know. Um, I haven't asked them specifically. I've heard the same thing being spread, that that may be the case. Um, it's possible. Um, there's good and bad to that, right? Bad is they could be at the convention, the good is they're not going to be at the legislature anymore. So yeah. there's that. Right? <laughs> um, but I will say some of them, I do know, relatively certainly, were in trouble. Maybe somebody in the Kenai Peninsula knew he wasn't going to get reelected because of how things were going. Probably decided it wasn't good to have it on your record to have a loss, so decided it's time to move on. Um, I know another one in Anchorage had promised the you know full PFD no matter what, and then joined that binding Democrat caucus, and that you know uh, Democrat you know House member was probably going to go down in flames. Okay, so a lot of them I think it's the record and knew what was going to happen, and rather than take the loss and not have a future later, because once you get that kind of baggage, it's real hard to overcome that later. I think a lot of them are bailing for maybe future plans, or they knew they weren't going to win. So, and there's other reasons. I've talked to one or two that were tired or just ready to be out, and I think that's effective to a lot of them. So, thank you. Sure. John. Senator Shower, thank you very much for coming out and talking about the Constitutional Convention. I too believe that's very important that we get out there and take action which is what I would ask is what is the action steps other than sharing this on socialistic media <laughs> and getting banned, what are some other steps that we can take? Is there any uh, action groups out there that are actually taking steps, putting up a website, putting up some information that we can share? Uh, is there billboards looking at being put up? I got money in my pocket, I'd put it out there right now. If somebody wants to stand up and start that process and start that initiative, because it's gonna take action. So what steps can we take as action? Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, so um, unfortunately, as some people know, I had hoped 
to be able to spend this summer um, rearranging the chessboard with the pieces and putting them where they needed to be, including focusing on the Constitutional Convention. Unfortunately, I found myself having to now campaign and raise money and do stuff because apparently I'm not conservative enough or whatever in the Valley, so now I have a challenger and I'm having to deal with that and a lot of other issues, so be it. Um, so I'm not able to focus on that as much as I want to. Um, but there are people that I've been trying for almost a year to set up a structure. I can tell you there's a couple people from the Anchorage Roundtable and a few others that we have been in discussions for weeks because I'm kind of multitasking here to find a couple things. One, John's a benefactor or multiple benefactors. And by benefactors, I mean people with checkbooks, money, because it takes money, right? Number one, and we're getting tons of money from the other side. That I'll tell you how desperate they are to kill it, right? And it's only certain people. I, I had that theme earlier. So we need benefactors. We need money. That can be from grassroots. That can be from starting our own, uh, you know, pack, if you will, so people can donate to it and we can get the message out. We need somebody that will lead it. I'm looking at somebody that's got a name. I'd like to see, like, and I'll just throw out, like, Warren Lehman, for example. I, I've talked to him. I think he supports a constitution commission, a former lieutenant governor, very calm guy, well respected. It'd be nice to have somebody like that that would come on board and kind of be the guy, you know, leading the charge, if you will, somebody to look to. We need a structure. We do. I'm sorry. I, I hate having oh, more committees, right? But we need a structure of people that are going to be, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's the money we have available. Here's how we're going to buy radio ads. We're going to do stuff on social media. We're going to get the signs out. We're going to do all these different things in a wave coming up because it's really going to matter within that last probably six weeks before the general election. We've got to be on the step to get people to know that. And we've got to be able to counter the message. I guarantee you're going to see full airwaves of don't do it. And I'm telling you right now, folks, if you're not, be fearless on this. I'm telling you, be fearless. Do not be afraid. And I need you to spread the message. So it's not in place yet, John, but I will tell you, I'm working with people hoping that somebody's going to pick this up and run with it, articles and other stuff, because we need that. Unfortunately, like I said, for me, I was hoping to kind of be one of the people on that leading the charge. I don't think I can know um, because I'm, I'm gonna have to waste my time. Um, trying to stay in the seat and go back and make sure we can execute some of these things. So we'll see how it goes. You might be in that and you said you had a checkbook, so stand by. <laughs> you volunteered, <laughs> all told. Um, I think one last one that we're sure, done and I'll, call, I'll knock it off. Clayton? First statement, real quick. No binding caucus. I wouldn't join it anyway. Last thing I had. Another thing, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the spirit to the bringing down of fortresses. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's my people. We are not battling the, the, the flesh. We're battling spirits. I, I do believe that. I really do. I'm Christian. You guys know that I'm unabashed. And that's why I use the word fearless. Don't be afraid. If you're afraid, you're letting the enemy win. Be fearless in the march. Okay, and Edna said that's the time we're done with folks. So I do get a chance to plug myself though, because like I said, I have to run for this. So, you know, there's some signs back there, you know, whatever, if you want to take one, that's great. You know, help out, ask the questions, look at website, whatever, but I am having to run so I can use your support, help people or, or get people to help spread that. So um, we need the right people in that. Uh, I do, it's MikeShower.com. We actually purchased that, so MikeShower.com. Go to Mike Shower. this is like the commercial on the radio. Go to MikeShower.com, we gotta say it like 10 times, MikeShower.com, right? So if you go there, it's got the donate and all the other stuff on it, whatever, but I could use the help folks because I, we are playing chess. And we need to be playing chess and we need to be rearranging the board with the right players in the right place and we need to be thinking three four or five moves ahead not behind we've been too reactive it's time to get ahead of it we are gaining ground by some of the legislative bodies and who's going to go back so we'll have a chance and then this whole constitutional convention we'll see where it is i think i'm supposed to stop there um, I appreciate your time tonight. Let me come out. I thank you for keeping this focused on the Constitutional Convention and ranked choice voting. I'll come back and do that again if we want because I know that's a big topic in front of us. I'm not as worried about the primary. I'm really worried about the general because it's complicated, so we'll do it again. I'm happy to help with that. And like I said, Michelle and I will stay after and answer questions for other things. So thanks for your patience. Um, and I think the last thing, just because of that right there, maybe could, I know maybe it's not standard, but I think it'd be kind of cool if we closed in prayer for what the state needs, the battle in front of us, and what we need to do to be ready to Yes, we'll all stand, uh, all of you that attend any time, you know we always do close in prayer, so anyway.
Lord, we just thank you for this great country that you have given us, Lord. And as we have said time and time again, Lord, we are not going to give up the battle. We have drawn a line in the sand, and we will not allow the enemy to cross over to that, to our side. We will continue to be forthright. We will continue. We will not become battle-weary. We will continue in faith. We will fulfill the plan and purpose that you have for each one of our lives. Some of you are not called to be senators, representatives, mayors, or whatever. But look, the Lord, when he created you in your mother's womb, created you to be a plan and a purpose to fulfill his desire in this world that we live in. And so I encourage each one of you to do that. Lord, I ask you to you make it clear to them, Lord, and they will not be able to draw back. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you all my fellow Alaskans for being here today. Please like and share this video. If not, you are failing your fellow Alaskans. This has been a very important discussion for the last couple of hours about the Constitutional Convention and why we should be voting yes for it come November. If you're not sharing this video, you are part of the reason why we got a problem. I do appreciate the 51 shares that we have out there right now. That is an awesome start. I would like to see that become 102 shares. I know we can double the amount of shares with the amount of people that have been watching this here tonight, and it's greatly appreciated. Those of you that are looking at me going, oh my gosh, Bert is wearing a mask. Well, I'm on the backside of COVID, and we got a lot of seniors in the inside of this place. I'm still not at 100%, so I'm making sure that I don't spread what I've got to everybody else. So that's why you see this on my face. I will be dead tomorrow night, so I encourage assembly. I will definitely see you there. They're going to veto, try to override the veto for the impeachment process for the mayor um, that the mayor has already vetoed. They're going to try to override it. And then there's a rumor out there that they're going to immediately try to impeach him once they have overridden that veto. Uh, so please make sure, like and share this video. Alaskans need to know about the Constitutional Convention. Go to my website, politic.com. Click that donate button. All proceeds goes right into covering the gas money. Making sure I got like the battery pack that was able to allow me to stream all six hours of last assembly meeting solid all the way through. And yes, it was that assembly meeting that made me have to wear this because that is where I caught that god-awful disease at. And it, I blame everything on them, just like you all should, too. You guys all have yourself a great evening. And again, like and share. Thank you all for being here.